welcome to Dr. Creepin's Dungeon. Ancient Rome, a formidable force in its time. But how would they deal with modern U.S. Marines? Well, a direct confrontation would heavily favor the U.S. Marines due to their technological superiority, the complexity of warfare, and the unpredictable nature of combat. But the Romans' historical prowess and adaptability would certainly pose interesting challenges in such a fictional confrontation as we'll see in tonight's wonderful tale. Now, as ever, before we begin, a word of caution. Tonight's story may contain strong language, as well as descriptions of violence and horrific imagery. That sounds like your kind of thing. Then let's begin. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of ancient Rome, the Empire versus the Eagle, Globe, and Anchor. Part 1. Okay, hear me out. This is going to sound strange, but what if... What if my theory is actually true? It would explain a lot of things and answer a lot of questions that are plaguing us right now. Let's imagine for a moment that the Earth, alone in the galaxy, or perhaps even the universe, has been chosen to be nothing more than a giant chessboard. A chessboard where both time and space do not hinder or help in the outcome of the game. Now, let's imagine that there are two diametrically opposing forces at either end of the chessboard. Let's label them good and evil, light or dark, whatever you wish, who at critical times in cosmic history will take individuals or perhaps even entire military units and place them at strategic locations during crucial moments to affect the outcome of the timeline. What if these um, chess moves, for lack of a better term, has changed the course of our history over and over again. What if Abraham Lincoln actually lived, but a chess piece had been moved to assassinate him? What if Hitler had been killed in World War I, but a chess piece had been moved to save him? What if a chess piece had been moved to save Trump from assassination? <sighs> Excuse my French, said Colonel Solomon Gabriel. But are you freaking shitting me, Chaplain Johnson? The 48-year-old Marine Corps colonel, with the skin-tight buzz cut and the low flat top of prematurely white hair, glared at the chaplain of his 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit. Colonel Gabriel wasn't a religious man. Three tours of Iraq and two in Afghanistan pretty much convinced him there was no God, at least not a loving one, despite what his Marines might have seen and experienced in the last few days. Chaps, have the entire me you spread out on the beaches of the Reggio di Calabria, on the southern tip of Italy, and trapped two thousand years in the past. I ordered this command and staff meeting to complete all of the intel that we've been able to gather so far. That includes you briefing me on what the hell that thing was we saw. I need answers on how we're going to get my 2,400 marines back where they belong. Not a lecture on some metaphysical Doctor Who bullshit, or some ancient alien theory about Jesus, the lightsaber-wielding Jedi. Sir, I'm just offering, said the chaplain, Major Brent Johnson. Sir, interrupted Captain Tanya Tonelli, the MIUS-2 intelligence officer and one of the few female officers serving in the unit. There are historical records of entire units vanishing without a trace. Though relatively young for her rank, Tonelli's retired U.S. Marine Corps Command Sergeant Major Father had toughened her up and... She could take a good ass chewing like the rest of them if she knew she deserved it. Captain Tonelli never took any unwarranted shit from anybody. During the Battle of Gallipoli in World War I, a British unit named the Norfolk Regiment, made up of 250 men and 16 officers, charged across open territory towards enemy positions when a thick cloud bank descended on them. When it rose, the entire unit had completely vanished from the battlefield. The event was reportedly observed by several witnesses, including soldiers from the nearby New Zealand army. And uh, in 1939, when the Japanese invaded China, continued Captain Tonelli, a Chinese military force of 3,000 soldiers was deployed to defend the city of Nanjing. They vanished without a trace. The list goes on and on, sir. The five Avenger torpedo bombers lost without a trace in 1945 after World War II. Korea, Vietnam, 
Reports go back to this time period where entire Roman legions vanished, and even back into ancient Egyptian history. Captain Tonelli stopped when she saw Colonel Gabriel turning red and lower his head. She could tell from experience that the angry and frustrated expression on Colonel Gabriel's face, that the information she was providing wasn't what he wanted to hear. For his part, Colonel Gabriel had to grudgingly admit to himself that if Captain Tonelli was a young, intelligent, good-looking, physically fit male intelligence officer, he'd probably be ripping him a new asshole right now. And if he'd wanted a briefing about shows the History Channel played during Ratings Week, he would have asked for one. But since Captain Tonelli was a young, intelligent, good-looking, physically fit female intelligence officer, he knew he had to tame his anger. Granted, Colonel Gabriel wasn't a fan of the new politically correct and oversensitive military which was infecting his beloved corps like a plague, but he'd also proven that he was a staunch opponent of racial bias, sexism, and the creation of a hostile working environment which always rotted and decayed the units which they infected. Those marines who'd been found guilty of disobeying the warrior code soon found themselves to be ex-marines. Colonel Gabriel was more than happy to be the one signing their dishonourable discharge from the court. Thankfully, such cases were very few and far between in his meal, and motivation was always high among his young warriors. The 13th Mew had one of the highest retention ratings in the Marine Corps, a testament to the unit's high morale, dedication and trust in their junior and senior leadership. What Colonel Gabriel couldn't stand were the new congressionally mandated training briefings in which he was forced to sacrifice over a quarter of the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit's total yearly training time to such briefings as sensitivity training and training sessions in which social justice warriors encouraged Marines to get in touch with their easily offended inner liberals. His Marines patiently sat through those hours-long death-by-powerpoint briefings in which each Marine was lectured by bleeding-heart liberals on how Marines were brutish monsters unless they changed their negative and intolerant attitudes towards people who identified themselves as winged unicorns of rainbow and sprinkle-coloured freedom fighters. Well, if a Marine's first thought at zero dark thirty when they woke up in the morning wasn't... How can I embrace and love grown adults who have no idea which public restroom to use? Well, that Marine didn't have his priorities straight. While each of Gabriel's Marines dutifully rated each briefing a five out of five in relevance, importance, and promoting social justice, at least they'd be labelled as brutish monsters by their civilian slave masters, in reality, most of the Marines considered such constant and repetitive briefings tedious drivel to the point of being aggravating. They would have rather spent their training time doing something more relevant and important to promoting social justice, such as training to kill the shit out of the bad guys. Colonel Gabriel inhaled deeply as he spoke, and Captain Tonelli winced unconsciously, expecting an ass-chewing in front of her fellow staff and command officers, who were crowded inside the large tent that was serving as the unit's top tactical operations centre. Instead, in an aggravated though calmer and collected tone, Colonel Gabriel said, Look, Captain Tonelli, I'm not doubting whether or not those occurrences actually happened. Hell, we're stuck 2,000 freaking years in the past. But what I need to know are quantifiable and scientific theories of how we got here and what that thing was who said he was God. Most of all, I need to know how we're going to get the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit back to where we belong, or at least to the 1960s. Heard that was a fun frickin' decade. Captain Tonelli smiled inwardly, knowing that her plan to readjust the colonel's thinking might be working. Sir, for matters regarding a theological answer, I'm afraid Major Johnson is far more qualified than I am as your subject matter expert. She smiled gently, turning her head to look at the chaplain. Chaplain Johnson returned her conspiratorial gaze. Okay, I get it. You and Japs have been plotting against me. Colonel Gabriel leaned back in resignation. All right, Chaps, let me hear your theory. What well, was that guard we saw out there last week? Chaplain Johnson thought back to last Friday, when the 13th Mew was conducting a joint forces NATO exercise with the Primer Regimento San Marco, the elite Italian Marines. The start of the training operation would be done in typical Marine Corps awesomeness. 
the US Navy amphibious assault ship USS Kearsarge, and the Italian Navy amphibious assault ship San Giusto were steaming two miles off the coast of southern Italy, roughly 50 clicks northeast of Sicily. In the mystic blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea, the most elite fighting forces of the United States and Italy were training together, conducting an amphibious assault of the rocky beaches of Reggio di Calabria at the tip of Italy's boot. Though this was just a training exercise, it was no less an awe-inspiring sight as a full combat battalion of marines encased aboard amphibious assault vehicles slowly rumbled to shore. Two water jets propelling the large green and brown colored boat-shaped armored vehicles through the relatively calm waters. Columns of white fuel-fed smoke billowing behind the assault marines. Following the marine AAVs, other combat marines were aboard large air-cushioned landing craft, known as LCACs, which thundered to shore propelled over the churning waves by two powerful and incredibly noisy fans mounted at the aft of the vessel. These marines crammed aboard the LCACs, brought with them the MIU's main fire support weapons, consisting of light armoured vehicles called LAV-25s, a battery of six 155mm M777 towed howitzers, and even a platoon of four M1A2 Abrams main battle tanks. As the marines charged over the waves towards the shoreline, AH-1Z Viper attack helicopters and UH-1Y light attack helicopters flew low overhead, looking for hostile targets inland that might hamper the breach landings. Behind the hunter-killer Viper and Venom pairs of helicopters, unusual-looking MV-22 Osprey tilt-rotor aircraft flew about a mile behind, carrying more assault marines and equipment. And far above the marine helicopters and Ospreys, four Marine Corps AV-8 Harrier jump jets circled protectively, awaiting their call to drop their ordnance on enemy positions. To the east of the U.S. Marines, their Italian counterparts were also conducting similar amphibious landing operations, supported in the air by their own AV-8 Harriers and AW-101 Merlin helicopters. Colonel Gabriel stood on the bridge of the lead LCAC, just behind the first wave of assaulting Marines, watching with visible pride as his young Marines neared the shoreline of Reggio di Calabria, each team and squad all the way up to battalion-level command team operating like a well-oiled killing machine. Once the two assault forces landed ashore, the American and Italian marines would link up to begin a six-mile road march following the main seaside road east to a pre assigned location where they would consolidate and conduct 11 days of joint training exercises. His marines would enjoy the sight of the Mediterranean Sea off to their right as they conducted their six-mile road march. It was thought Colonel Gabriel. A great day to be a Marine. Chaplain Johnson was with Colonel Gabriel on the Elcax Bridge, along with a senior command staff. Johnson saw the phenomenon before the Elcax Navy captain said, Sir, looks like we got clouds rolling in. The Italian and American Meteor folks had previously reported that it would be clear today. High, thin clouds and 100% visibility. There were absolutely no clouds in the clear late spring skies over the Mediterranean, but right here in front of him, the force of AAVs just half a mile in front of the following LCACs had just vanished in a cloud bank so thick that it appeared that they disappeared behind a white wall. Before Chaplain Johnson could blink twice, the near-opaque cloud had already swallowed the LCACs, and for the Marine Chaplain, time literally stood still. Johnson tried to blink and turn his head, found that he could do neither. The cloud had enveloped everything in such a thick haze that Johnson couldn't see anything except the curtain of white, his fellow marines standing next to him having completely vanished. He felt as if he was submerged in tar, straining every muscle that he had just to blink. Even the rumbling of the Elkak had completely stopped, and though everything seemed deathly still and calm, Johnson's mind was racing. Time has stopped. Stopped, Chaplain Johnson realized in shock. Time stopped. Lord, what's happening here? No sooner had that impossible thought crossed his mind than a bright flash of light seemed to suck him forward. Chaplain Johnson would have screamed and raised his arms, if he could have, in a vain attempt to protect himself from being smashed to a pulp against the armored glass window of the Alcat Bridge. However, 
Instead of being splattered against the inside of the bridge, Chaplain Johnson saw his body phasing through the solid glass and instantly transported to the shore, where he stood on the beach amidst a slowly dissipating cloud. He found that he now had control of his movements again, and he looked around nervously, seeing that he was surrounded by his fellow marines who were also looking around with shocked and confused expressions on their faces. One second ago, they were driving AAVs over the choppy water to the shore, or sitting in the passenger compartment in the back getting seasick and throwing up. One second ago, they were piloting gunship helicopters, Ospreys, or Harrier jump jets. One second ago, they were aboard armoured vehicles on the landing craft, waiting to rumble off onto the beach. Now it appeared that the entire 13th Mew was standing on the beach, and Chaplain Johnson could see the questioning eyes of several marines staring at him, no doubt wondering if this was what heaven was supposed to be like. If Chaplain Johnson could speak, he would have said, I don't know. The beach at Reggio di Calabria, if indeed that is where the marines were, was made of coarse sand and smooth round stones. Visibility had improved some, though the sky above them and the seas behind them remained shrouded in a cloudy haze. Less than half a kilometre in front of them, the beaches led to a series of low foothills, which overlooked the shores and the sea. A glowing being about three hundred feet tall stood on the foothills, looking down and regarding the assembled marines with white, flaming eyes. Instinctively, several marines raised their weapons at the angelic entity, taking up whatever firing positions they could find on the open beach, while the security squad of recon marines took up defensive positions in front of Colonel Gabriel. No orders had to be shouted. Though scared and confused, the marines deployed to deal with the potential threat, propelled strictly by hard training and warrior resolve. Well, as we all know, this is the time of year when we set ourselves resolutions. Let's all just live a little bit better than we did last year, and everything will go ahead much better in our lives. Now, one thing I've done recently is to start using AG1. Now, this is a powerfully simple supplement, full of vitamins, minerals, whole food source nutrients, and more. All I need is one single scoop that takes seconds to mix each morning. And it helps to support my brain, heart, my energy levels, and my immune health. AG1 is a product that's fitted very easily into my overall wellness routine. It's a comprehensive as well as convenient daily nutrition supplement, consisting of over 70 high-quality ingredients in that one simple scoop. And it supports my physical and mental health. Now, science tells us that the human body is interconnected, which is why AG1 contains these 70 ingredients to support our baseline nutrition. Basically, drinking AG1 is the best way to feel reassured that I'm supporting my body with a broad range of nutrients that it needs. Now, there are so many benefits to this product, but I'm just going to mention a couple to you. Basically, I'm not getting any younger, and AG1 helps with healthy aging. It contains phytonutrients from whole foods, and this promotes longevity by supporting cellular metabolism, the health of my skin, my brain, and my heart. And of course, it's a great way to replenish the nutrients in my body. AG1 contains a broad spectrum of micronutrients and phytonutrients that keep the body nourished all day, every day. Like I said, one of the main reasons I like this is because it's just become an effortless daily habit. Uh, when we set good intentions, consistency really is the key, and building healthy habits can be quite difficult. That's why AG1 has been designed to be as quick and simple as possible. Yeah, just one scoop, once a day, mixed with water. It takes less than a minute and it tastes great too. So if, like me, you want to start living a little bit better and take ownership of your health, try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. All you need to do is go to drinkag1.com slash creepin. That's drinkag1.com slash creepin. C-R-E-E-P-E-N. Go there now and check it out. Part 2. Stand down, Marines, yelled Colonel Gabriel, his gruff voice breaking the eerie quiet which seemed to envelop the scene. Oh, your weapons and stay frosty. We don't have live rounds anyway. 
Fear not, my valiant warriors, for thou stand before the god of this land. The being spoke to the marines with a beautiful voice, its tone calming, almost hypnotic, and Chaplain Johnson could only describe the human-shaped giant as glorious. It was a male figure with a chiselled, muscular chest, barely hidden by a golden, flowing robe. The being's legs were also very muscular, and his feet were hidden under clouds of swirling smoke. The being, which called itself God, had a head which shined like the sun, Flowing white hair wreathed in lightning, framing a young and impossibly handsome face. Thou art safe here, my champions, considered the being calling itself God. Chaplain Johnson realised that the being wasn't speaking to them in the conventional term, but actually communicating with each marine through its thoughts. My name is Solomon Gabriel, Colonel, United States Marine Corps, yelled Colonel Gabriel. I am the commander of the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit based out of Marine Corps Base, Camp Pendleton, California. I am aware of who thou art, Colonel Gabriel, said the being, sounding somewhat annoyed at being interrupted. Thou art the Legion Legate, a commanding officer of one of our history's most elite warrior classes, known as United States Marines. Colonel Gabriel put his hands on his hips as he looked up at the glowing deity on the hill. Oh, you don't need to be a god to know that, he yelled. The being laughed humorously. Oh, arrogant and fearless, I have chosen well. But have a care how you speak, Colonel Gabriel, for I am the god of this land, and I shall brook no insubordination from my warriors, no matter how daring and bold. Oh, please don't tell him that these aren't his warriors, thought the chaplain. Please don't tell him that these warriors belong to the United States Marine Corps. Chaplain Johnson instead breathed a sigh of relief when Gabriel said instead, Are you the one who brought me and my marines here? Where exactly is he? Thou art upon the shores of Regium, which thou now call Regio di Caldabria, said the being. Chaplain Johnson gasped. The Reggio di Calabria hasn't been known as Regium for over a millennia, he thought. Ah, indeed, said the being, as if it had read the chaplain's mind. This land has not been known as Regium for many areas since your birth. There was a tinge of anger in the being's tone as he spoke. Several things have changed since the Kohav Bahia appeared. You still haven't answered my question, sir. It pained Colonel Gabriel to call the thing sir, but he was an atheist and would be damned if he'd addressed the thing as God. My marines would have come ashore at Reggio di Calabria without your help. Indeed, Colonel, said the being, but thou would not have arrived at the time in which thou were most needed. You and your warriors stand on the beaches of Regium, that is true, but thou standeth on the beaches two thousand years in your past. Forty days ere the fulfilment of the Kohav Bahia prophecy. Are you frickin' kidding? Started Colonel Gabriel. Sir, yelled Chaplain Johnson, putting his hand on Gabriel's shoulder and shaking his head in panic. If you really did bring us back to the biblical area, maybe we need to hear what God has to say before we incur his wrath. Colonel Gabriel exhaled angrily, glaring at the chaplain, but said nothing. Surprisingly, the being claiming to be God gave Chaplain Johnson a displeased expression, but spoke cordially with Colonel Gabriel. You are indeed wise to hear me out, Colonel Gabriel. Forty days hence a great calamity will occur which will shatter the very pillars of the world, started the being. Cultures will crumble and empires will fall, and the effects of such a world-destroying event will touch even thine own lives many millennia in the future. This must not stand. Therefore thou and thy mighty warriors have been chosen amongst all others to keep this calamity from occurring and affecting the world with its power. It is the only way that you may be allowed to return to your proper time. Hmm. Is that so? said Colonel Gabriel. And what is it that you're asking the thirteenth meal to do? The being suddenly radiated a feeling of accomplishment that bordered on sexual satisfaction. He smiled and his body shone even brighter. The prophecy of the Kohav Bahir must not be allowed to occur. 
The great pillars must not be allowed to fall. In order to prevent this, thy marines must destroy the military legions of the Roman Empire. Hmm. With all of your great power, said Colonel Gabriel, why can't you do that yourself? Why couldn't you prevent the prophecy of the Yabba Dabba Do? Do not try my patience, mortal. The glowing being seemed to diminish in its brightness and glory, its beauty replaced by a moment of ugly rage. Still, Colonel Gabriel stood his ground. I am the god of this land, therefore the Roman legions are my children. It is not for me to carry out this task. For the sake of your world, and for your future, this is a task which can only be accomplished by the United States Marines. Well, chaps, said Gabriel, was that or wasn't it God that we saw three days ago? Chaplain Johnson gulped. In my opinion, sir, uh, the answer would be no. If it were, then none of us would probably be alive, as no man could set eyes on him and live. Okay, then, I'll bite, said Gabriel. Was that some sort of angel of his? Again, sir, I'd have to say no, replied Johnson. Angels have been said to be so glorious that those who saw them were either so struck with fear that they collapsed, or they fell in worship of them. Neither of those events occurred amongst the Marines, and I noticed that since no one fell in worship of that being, well, it caused it some consternation. In the Old Testament of the Bible, angels would always say that they were not God, but his servant a messenger. That being on the hill said that he was the God of this land. If he were truly God, he would have announced himself as the God of the universe. To put what that being said in perspective, he'd be like he was admitting to be the God of Toledo, Ohio. So, who do you think that was, Jabs? The deep-sounding voice came from Command Sergeant Major Jacob Jake Tunstall. The veteran Black Marine had been the unit's senior-ranking NCO through their last two deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Angel of Light. The Devil. I'm not certain, Sergeant Major, said Chaplain Johnson, though I did suspect that he didn't like me being here, as if he considered me as an adversary. What was it that the being said? continued Sergeant Major Tunstall. He mentioned something about the prophecy of Kohaf Bahir not being allowed to occur. What does that mean? I haven't heard about a prophecy of the Kahaf Bahir, admitted Chaplain Johnson. It doesn't sound like a Latin phrase, nor does it sound like anything from the modern Italian language, but it sounds familiar. We don't have internet here, obviously, so I can't reference it online. We're running out of time, folks, said Colonel Gabriel. Well, whatever that thing is, it said that the veil hiding us from the rest of Roman eyes will be lifted in three days after which the powers of the Roman legions will be unleashed upon us. That three-day alibi ends in twelve hours, and we have to assume that, after that, we'll be in direct combat with at least one Roman legion. The marines of the MEU were assembled on the beach, along with their combats, combat support, combat service support, and logistical vehicles. All of the marine vehicles had somehow been parked neatly in rows on the hard-packed ground of the beach. Above the beach on a low hill of similarly hard-packed ground, but which lacked the smooth stones and rocks which might have harmed them when they were launched, were part of the Mew's Viper attack helicopters and the Venom light attack helicopters, as well as the Ospreys and four Marine AV-8 Harrier jump jets. Their quartermaster equipment, including the water purification equipment and the 500-gallon water containers, were also located there, as well as the tents and the field kitchens. Aside from that, Mountains of pallets stacked high with ammunition, MREs, bottled water, fuel blivets, extra tires and everything else that could sustain an entire mew for a high-intensity operation that was supposed to last no more than two months also awaited the MEU on the beaches, although the Marines had no idea how those had got there. Unknown to them, an airdrop ammunition resupply of 155mm howitzer rounds dropped from C-130 Hercules transport aircraft to the 82nd Airborne's artillery battalion vanished into thin air, while material from the military storage facilities located across the world had almost mysteriously disappeared, only to reappear on the beaches of Reggio de Calabria. 
The personnel frantically searching for the tons and tons of missing fuel, munitions, and Class One supplies never knew that the missing materials could be found 2,000 years into the past. The being that had called itself God had only transported those marines into the past who were essential to fighting the Roman legions. Those marines whose military occupational specialties involved signals intelligence, satellite communications, electronic warfare, naval gunfire liaison, and any other specialty which relied on modern technology outside of that which was organic to the Miu, were left behind, as the technologies required did not exist 2,000 years ago. Aside from the Navy Corps men, who were also allowed to remain, the Miu would be acting as a separate, self-sustaining combat element. The glowing being had also granted the Miu three days of grace in which it said that the area five kilometres around where the Marines now stood would be blind from detection from the Romans, although the Roman Emperor Tiberius had been forewarned of the coming of the Marines. This would give the Marines three days to prepare their defences and prepare for the coming campaign. At that, the glowing being departed from the Marines, and the misty haze which surrounded them lifted, revealing a bright, clear and warm morning. Watches which ran on batteries still worked, and although the hours were off by a couple thousand years, Colonel Gabriel saw that only a few seconds had passed since he and his marines had been taken from their timeline. Immediately, Colonel Gabriel sent out his light armoured reconnaissance company to scan the surrounding area, informing them that under no circumstances were they to engage the local population, and if they should encounter hostile Roman soldiers, to pull back and readjust course. He didn't like his position on the beaches and ordered the Miu to prepare to move to a more secure location once it was located. As soon as the infantry combat elements had traded in their blank rounds for live ammunition from the stocks which had mysteriously appeared on the beaches, they were to move out by company to secure a one kilometre perimeter around the area while the armoured vehicles loaded ammunition, fuel and provisions for the anticipated move off the beaches. Colonel Gabriel kept his air assets grounded for the moment, not fully trusting the being when it said it would shield them from sight. Did that also apply to high-flying, long-ranging aircraft? Well, instead, Gabriel ordered his scouts to make extensive use of the recon drone assets available to them. Fortunately, they had no shortage of modern 1 to 50,000 scale area maps of the area, since they had no GPS or satellite tracking capabilities. This meant that the marines would be navigating overland using the old map and compass method. By mid-afternoon, the scouts reported back that they were just within the five-kilometer boundary and that they'd seen no other signs of human life or habitation, though they did find several roads made of smooth brick which ran east to west. The beach at which the marines had landed was surrounded by rocky foothills, but about two kilometers from that, the land levelled off to flat rolling plains and fields which gradually dipped into a wide and shallow valley. This valley extended for several miles before sloping up again into more foothills, and gradually towards taller mountains. The infantry units also reported no contacts or signs of human habitation, so Gabriel ordered them to push out another kilometre. Part 3 by late afternoon, the 1st Platoon Recon patrolling to the east reported that they had what looked like several villages under observation, but that they seemed to have been uninhabited and abandoned recently. Ordered to proceed and investigate with caution, but with the same rules of engagement that none of the local population were to be engaged, and if hostiles appear, the Marines were to retreat. Thirty minutes later, the Recon Platoon reported back to the talk that... All of the villages had been abandoned, seemingly in a very organised and deliberate manner. Colonel Gabriel ordered them to hold in place at one of the larger villages, which contained a number of abandoned homes and buildings, made of the same smooth white stone used to construct the roads. Using his map, Colonel Gabriel saw that the villages were north of what is modern-day Melito de Porto Salvo, an area of grassy higher ground which then led down into the more traversable valley going north. It was a very strategic location for the ancient Romans for fishing and farming, and Gabriel wondered why it had been abandoned. 
A while later, the recon platoon scouting north and northwest reported very few signs of habitation up on the rocky foothills, and few places where the Miu vehicles could maneuver. Ordering his recon marines to hold place and maintain observation, he ordered 1st platoon at Melito de Porto Salvo to secure the area and prepare for the Miu's arrival, paying special attention to marking areas which the aircraft could land. Not wanting to move in the evening, Gabriel called his command and staff officers into his tent, informing them that he was going forward to assess the situation at Melito de Porto Salvo to see if it was a suitable site for the Miu. If he determined that it was, Gabriel informed his commanders that the Mio would be moving off the beaches at 1000 hours the next morning, following breakfast. In the meantime, Gabriel admonished his combatant commanders to ensure that their equipment was serviceable and accountable, and that their units be ready to move within 24 hours. Normally, Gabriel would take the UH-1 Venom helicopter to do an aerial recon, but instead he travelled overland with his reconnaissance platoon to link up with the 1st platoon at Melito de Porto Salvo. Utilising the recon platoon's up-armoured Humvees to cover the short 5 kilometer distance, Colonel Gabriel was amazed at the sophistication of the ancient paved Roman roadway. Though it was hardly capable of accommodating any of his vehicles, much less their tracked and armoured vehicles, it was still an impressive feat of ancient road construction, and though the way was narrow and rocky in many places, the marine vehicles could traverse the route, proving their worth as they had in the rocky mountains of Afghanistan. The thing that bothered Gabriel was that this wide and obviously major travel road was abandoned of all people, and, as his recon elements had reported, so were all of the villages and habitations surrounding the marine landing point for five kilometres. Well, this could only confirm that Emperor Tiberius had ordered the evacuation of this part of southern Italy, and the only reason why he would do this was because he was fully aware that the US Marines had landed. Admittedly, despite being thrust in such an outlandish and otherworldly situation, he was actually looking forward to matching his wits and warriors with the great Roman military generals of ancient times. On schedule at ten hundred hours of their second day in ancient Rome, Colonel Gabriel ordered the 13th Mew to move out. The move from the beachhead to the abandoned village north of Melito de Porto Salvo the next morning went off without a hitch, with 2nd Platoon Recon leading the way and 3rd Platoon Recon bringing up the rear. Gabriel's biggest concern, his air assets, had launched successfully from the beaches and turned south over the Mediterranean so that they wouldn't be travelling overland and flew up to their landing area approaching from the south. Colonel Gabriel didn't start to breathe again until the last of his AV-8 Harriers and Ospreys had touched down near the southern perimeter of the temporary base camp and had shut down. The entire Mew was encamped on a relatively flat elevated spot of land, roughly one square kilometre, with the large abandoned village immediately to their west. To their east and west, were the rocky foothills which gradually rose to mountains. To the south was the Mediterranean Sea, while directly north was the wide valley which led through fertile farming lands. Colonel Gabriel gave instructions that they would not be occupying any of the abandoned structures in any of the villages, and ordered the 13th Mew to begin setting up their temporary operating base camp while the scouts were ordered forward again. Gathered again inside the large tent being utilised as the MEU top, the assembled command and staff gathered around the tactical map, covered in laminate, to discuss the current situation and develop the initial CONOP, concept of operations. First and foremost, while their mission was to destroy the military legions of the Roman army, the Marines wanted to leave as small a footprint as possible on the timeline. The being that had called itself God had given them a relatively simple objective. From the Reggio di Calabria, the Marines would follow the coast road northeast to Sibaris in what is modern day Sabari, 200 kilometers away. From there, the Miu would turn northwest, headed inward towards Venusia, located in what is now known as Northern Potenza. From there, the Marines were to travel northwest again to northern Neapolis, known today as Naples. From there, the Marines would turn north towards the heart of the Empire, Rome. All told, 
A straight road march taking that route was 700 kilometers, so some 440 miles. The glowing being promised to provide resupplies of munitions, provisions, and fuel along the way, in the same manner in which he had supplied the marines on the beaches of Recchio. Okay, said Major Alexander Easter, the S-3 operations officer, as he addressed the staff. Assuming that the entity is true to his word and will provide the necessary resupply, then we'd need to resupply twice for fuel, preferably at Potenza and Naples. Going over the mountains as we'd have to, we'd be burning 30 to 50 percent more fuel than we would during normal operations. That includes combat maneuvering. Still, even given the fact that there are no established roads that will hold our vehicles, we should be on the outskirts of Rome in less than a week to three days. Though we should plan for longer if we have to deal with civilian traffic and combat operations. Weather, said Colonel Gabriel to Captain Tonelli. Since the meteo specialists relied on current satellite data, they had not been included in the MIU. Therefore, it was left to Captain Tonelli to make her best guess, based on known historical data. Assumptions remain the same, sir, replied Tonelli. If we're transported here during the same month that we were taken, then we're still in the spring season between April and May. We can expect temperate climates of around 65 to 70 degrees, with an expected rainfall not to exceed four inches and mostly sunny and clear skies. <clears throat> Perfect vacation weather grunted Gabriel, or to begin a military campaign. Gabriel exhaled and put his hands to his chin. Is it just me, or does anyone else find it odd that we were given forty days to accomplish this mission? If we assume that Emperor Tiberius was forewarned that we were here, it should also be safe to assume that he has recalled some of his legions from around the known world to defend Rome. Forty days would allow them to prepare defensive positions while allowing other units to get into blocking positions along our route of march, said Major Easter. So you're saying that the entity is playing both sides then, concluded Gabriel, forewarning Tiberius that we were coming and providing him with our route of march. Instead of making us hunt all over the known world to engage the legions, said Major Easter grimly, the entity's using Tiberius to bring them to us. Sir, said Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Arch Wainwright, the ground combat element commander. What about the moral and ethical issues that we're asking our Marines to face? We're looking at a total enemy force structure of around 200,000 men. Killing just one of them may alter the course of our timeline. Plus, several of our Marines have Italian ancestry. Captain Tonelli winced at that last comment. Sir... We need to take that into consideration as we begin this operation, continued Lieutenant Colonel Wainwright. Colonel Gabriel nodded in agreement. On the beaches the other day, he told the entity that he was not going to allow his marines to be used as a tool, whether the entity was God or not. The marines were bound to uphold the Constitution of the United States, though it was still 2,000 years coming. The entity went white with rage, and for a moment it looked as if it would have struck down Colonel Gabriel for his insolence, but it held its wrath. Thou remind me of other heroes of this age which hath opposed my will, so I will give you this generous concession, Colonel Gabriel. Follow this route to Rome, but do not cross her boundaries. Stay there south of the city until forty days passes. Once forty days and forty nights have passed, I shall return you back to your proper time and to your homes. Colonel Gabriel crossed his arms, refusing to be bullied. And if I refuse? The entity calling itself God sneered. Then forty days shall become forty years, shall become four hundred years, that you and your warriors shall be trapped here, long dead and forgotten, ere your bones are discovered. In the meantime, shall I bring forth upon the shores of Rechium another marine expeditionary unit, and if their commander is as insolent and unwise as you, I shall bring another and another and another, until one of your kind has the wisdom to see the reason of his holy quest, which is to stop the catastrophic prophecy which would destroy kingdoms and lay low empires. Colonel Gabriel still didn't believe the entity's claim of being God, but... He did know that it had the capability to snatch up entire military units from modern times and transport them to the past. If he refused, 
the entity would just discard the 13th Mew and simply grab another unit. Though Colonel Gabriel graduated third from his command and staff college, and first in war college, nothing that he'd been taught prepared him for the Star Trek Captain Kirk bullshit he was facing now. With the greatest reluctance of his life, Gabriel accepted the entity's offer. Ultimately, Colonel Wainwright, said Gabriel, I take full responsibility for every action which my marines will be forced to take while we're stuck in this timeline including every casualty we inflict. Having said that, it's not my intent to engage in offensive operations against any military unit here, Roman or otherwise. Sir, said Colonel Wainwright, I only agreed to move our forces to the south of Rome, taking the route which the entity gave us, said Gabriel. I never agreed to conduct offensive operations along the way. If we're forced into combat, it'll be a defensive battle. Gabriel walked to the map which hung on the inside of the tent. Okay, folks, first of all, I need to know what exactly we're facing. Specifically, what's a Roman legion of this time period's tactical organization and equipment? Colonel Gabriel turned to his ground combat commander. Colonel Wainwright, you seem to know a little bit about ancient Roman legion numbers. Can you share what you know? Of course, Colonel, said Wainwright. Besides, who hasn't fantasized matching wits and warriors against the great Roman military generals of ancient times? Colonel Wainwright walked to the map next to the shorter but stockier Colonel Gabriel. Wainwright was a tall, white, senior officer with wavy brown hair and tan skin with an athletic build and absolutely no body fat. A very recruiting poster of a relatively young Marine senior commander. Wainwright began his briefing, having anticipated what information Colonel Gabriel would be looking for. A single Roman legion consisted of between 4,000 to 5,000 soldiers, roughly equivalent to a modern combat brigade. They were further subdivided into units called cohorts, or battalion-sized elements, which were in turn subdivided into centurias, which were company-sized units. Depending on the ground in which we chose to defend, we could easily overmatch several legions. However, if the ground's open to maneuver, say, by a large force of cavalry, we might be at a disadvantage. Our route of march limits their approaches to us up to Potenza, said Gabriel, studying the map. We'll have the mountains to our left and the sea to our right. However, once we get to Potenza and head across the peninsula to Naples, we'll be in relatively open territory. The going will be considerably more difficult from there. Captain Tonelli. Colonel Gabriel spun around, addressing his intelligence officer. Give me that report on their capabilities. Captain Tonelli stood up to give her report. She would usually have done her briefing on PowerPoint, but now it was written on a notebook. She wasn't as big an expert on ancient Roman military structure and tactics as Colonel Wainwright, and was grateful when he offered his assistance to her. Sir, she began, the Roman legions we can expect to encounter are equipped with specialized formations, same as ours. Each legion has a cavalry element of some two to three hundred skilled horsemen used for reconnaissance and outflanking maneuvers. They have a light infantry section used primarily as scouts, skirmishers, and javelin casters. The main combatant elements of the legion are comprised of the heavy infantry which are themselves subdivided into novice, competent, and experienced soldiers, with the novice soldiers usually filling the front ranks of an engagement. We can also expect auxiliary units, similar to our combat support units, or siege weapons ranging from ballistae to catapults, which may not harm our heavier armoured vehicles, but are a threat to our light-skinned vehicles. We can expect these ranged weapons to be effective, out to 200 metres, their bows also having the same effective range. Thank you, Captain, said Gabriel, turning to address his officer. Marines, in less than twelve hours, the grace period which we'd been afforded is set to expire, and we'll literally be stepping out to make or rewrite history. There's a lot yet which we don't know, but we do know this. We are Marines. We will uphold our duty to the Constitution and to our country. We will not be aggressive, nor shall we seek out any aggression. We will fight only when the fight is brought to us, and if we can save lives, we'll do so at every opportunity. We will stand at the gates of Rome, but do so peacefully, waiting out the remainder of the forty days. Sir, 
said Command Sergeant Major Tunstall. What if that thing we saw on the beach doesn't fulfill his end of the bargain? Oh, then me and Chaplain Johnson are going to have a serious come-to-Jesus moment with God, said Gabriel. Sir, interrupted S-6 Communications NCO as he ran into the talk. Sorry, sir, but Scout 1 and Scout 2 has made contact. Colonel Gabriel lowered his binoculars. He was standing at the first scout's positions, two kilometers to the east of the Neal. One mile to the east, a force of at least 5,000 Roman soldiers were advancing over the rocky foothills. To their north, second scouts were reporting that a force of 5,000 Romans were approaching up the valley, about one and a half miles distant. The second scouts to the north had reported that the Roman legion seemed to be setting up camp for the night, while Gabriel could see that the Roman legion to the east was still advancing across the rocky foothills towards the marine base camp. Get my indirect fire boys on the radio, Artie and Mortis, said Colonel Gabriel, and have my ready flight of harriers and vipers ready to launch. Sir, you still have the blind cover for several more hours, said Colonel Wainwright, who was standing with the colonel along with Major Easter. It appears that they're looking in our direction, but they can't see us. Once we send anything out of that five-kilometer blind spot, we'll be visible to anyone. I know, Arch, said Gabriel. If we allow that time to expire before we react, we hand over the initiative to the Romans. No, the Romans know we're here, and they know we're a threat, so we're taking the initiative now. Besides, I'm through playing by that entity's rule. Part 4 Senator Furius Camillus strode hesitantly across the polished marble floor of the chamber that Emperor Tiberius was using as his grand courtroom. Camillus walked past a row of armoured Praetorian guards and nervously handed the scroll to his emperor. Emperor Tiberius had travelled from Rome all the way south to the military garrison in the mountains west of Crotona to be close to the battle. More news from our forces in Regium, my liege, Camillus said. Tiberius unfurled the scroll, his brows furrowing in anger almost immediately. Legion Legate, Marcus Lollis. Legion Il Parthica. Hail Caesar Tiberius. The Legion Il Parthica has met the invaders as we crossed the foothills over the shores of Regium. My scouts led the vanguard of the Legion but at the place where we had been informed the invaders had made camp, my cavalry commander, Captain Castus, informed me that naught could be seen upon the high plains except the villages we had ordered to be evacuated. The shadows were growing long by the time the rest of the Legion Il Parthica arrived and we made to start camp for the evening. Already we received word from Legion XVI Gemina, that they had already made camp in the valley along the northern approaches to the beaches. However, ere Apollo could complete his trek across the sky, the veil of secrecy was lifted over the plain, and we could plainly see the invaders. Though they were still far distant, we could see that they were giants, each clothed in some type of strange green and brown armor, which made them appear to blend with their surroundings. And they rode upon terrible dragons of many sizes, and they were coloured in either shades of sand or in colours of green and brown. I was only afforded a moment's view of the enemy, when there came the sound like that of the rumbling of the oceans from an angry Neptune, from where the invaders stood, and all about us came a terrible whistling. Then the earth before the legion was ripped and torn apart, as if by lightning strikes from Jupiter himself. With every thundering blow to the ground, the earth screamed and shook so much that even the goddess terror must have trembled. The hearts of even my bravest veteran warriors melted in the face of such power, and they ran from the field, dropping sword and shield and covering their ears as they fled. But that was not the end of our horrors, for in the skies above us, two terrible winged dragons roared in fury, diving upon us in terrifying warrior, rider, and horse. With the grey armoured dragons flew giant armoured locusts, whose beating wings served only to spread terror as they spit stinging slugs around the legion as we fled for our lives. Although not a single one of my soldiers lost their lives, 
The brief attack upon us caused the entire Legion Ilpathica to flee the field, all of us looking over our shoulders with nervous eyes, hoping that the fearsome dragons and locusts were not in pursuit. My Emperor, it is my belief that what had been unleashed upon us is but a very small example of the invaders' power. I hesitate to call them gods, but they command terrible dragons and fire from the heavens, and it is a power that a single legion cannot hope to match. Currently, Legion Ilpathica is in retreat to the mountains in the west. I fear that the best we can do is keep the invaders in sight and observe their movements. I remain your faithful servant, Legion Legati Marcus Lollius, Legion Ilpathica. Emperor Tiberius tossed the scroll aside in anger. This damned message repeats the same message which you brought to me from Legion 60 in Gemina this morning, Senator Camillus. My liege, stammered Camillus, I am simply the messenger. I... Who are the camp prefects of Ilpathica and 60 in Gemina? interrupted Tiberius. Titus Lassius from 60 in Gemina and Senator Lucius Cornelius from Ilpathica answered Senator Camillus. Oh, send them congratulations, said Emperor Tiberius. They have been promoted to Legion Legat. Tell them that their first task is to arrest their former Legion commanders and try them for treason and cowardice in front of their troops. Only their heads need to be returned to Rome. Once that has been done, tell Legati Cornelius to move Ilpathica west and reinforce Legion to Italica at Cortona. Order Legata Lassius to take sixty in Gemina south and trap the invaders between them and Crotona. The invaders are limited in their movements, with the mountains to their north and the seas to their south. The legions are to crush them on the southern roads. Yes, of course, my leech, nodded Camerus. Also, said Tiberius, send this order to every single soldier serving the empire. I decree that any soldier, no matter what rank or social standing, who takes one step backwards in the face of the invaders, has forfeit their own lives. The only way is forward to either victory or death. Colonel Gabriel had watched with satisfaction when the northern and eastern force of Roman legions had broken and fled in panic. His combined mortar and artillery strikes had landed far enough away to not have inflicted any casualties, but close enough to shake the ground while his harriers and vipers added to the panic of the two Roman legions. He'd allowed his marines to get whatever restless sleep they could that night, before moving off the beaches as planned in the morning. Once again his scouts led the way, while his air assets circled overhead. While they were a great asset to the marines, Colonel Gabriel had neither the aviation fuel nor did the aircraft have the endurance to maintain flight indefinitely. Right now, the primary mission of the Mew was to find an elevated and defendable area which his air assets could land and use as an airbase that could still support the Mew's movement to Rome. He'd have to leave a security detachment force to defend the airbase, but that couldn't be helped. It was decided that the most likely place for a suitable temporary airbase would be located north of Potenza. So Gabriel sent his Venoms and three platoons of Marines aboard Ospreys to locate a suitable site. Coordinating so many moving parts was risky, especially keeping communications with all separate elements, but Colonel Gabriel didn't want to risk keeping the Marines on the beach and allow the Romans to regroup. The ground movement of the Mew was unopposed but slower than expected. The roads and passages sometimes became too rocky or too narrow for large vehicles, and already the armoured vehicle launch bridge had to be employed so that the Mew could cross over flowing bodies of water. For the first time, the marines were encountering local civilians. Several towns and villages dotted the southern roads, and as the Roman civilians saw the powerful invaders approaching, riding their growling tan and green dragons with their terrible grey dragons circling overhead, they fled in panic. Gabriel would call a halt to allow the civilians ample time to gather their belongings and leave. By the time they reached the outskirts of a large town in what is now modern-day Soverato, Colonel Gabriel ordered a halt south of a narrow flowing river. They'd only travelled a hundred kilometres from the beaches. The area which they halted at was on a flat field and wide enough to allow ample space for the entire Mew to form a defensive perimeter while their air assets could land in the middle. 
Two well-constructed stone bridges crossed the river, which could sustain the weight of the Mew's lighter vehicles, but would not hold the weight of the tanks. Gabriel sent two armoured LAV 25s and a platoon of Marines over the bridge to secure the far side. It was late afternoon, and Gabriel wanted to allow a full day for the civilians living in the town surrounding their route of advance to evacuate, while his scout's search for a place narrow enough for the heavier machine vehicles to cross. The main force Miu would camp here for the night, while the detachment searched for a suitable airfield further north. If all went well, they'd make Sibari by the next day, where the entity promised a resupply of fuel awaited them. While his marines were busily setting up night defensive positions, Gabriel received word that his scouts had located several potential areas north of the Potenza region, which could be suitable for a forward airfield. Gabriel sent his executive officer... Lieutenant Colonel Bradley, Brad Lively, to check out the potential sites aboard his personal helicopter, instructing him that he wanted his assessment as soon as possible, as the air assets were vulnerable at this location. Colonel Gabriel then boarded an Osprey to do an aerial recon of their forward march route the next day. The roadways would choke with civilians moving east and north. That would be a problem, along with the two choke points he saw along the way to Zibari. The Miu could turn off and travel across country around the civilians, but the choke points, a place where the mountains closed to form a narrow passageway, would be a different story. He returned from his reconnaissance mission in time to receive the assessment from Lieutenant Colonel Brad Lively, who reported that he'd found the best place to establish the airfield, in a flat elevated area at the base of a valley surrounded on the east, south and west by mountains, and having a commanding position of the surrounding area. The downside was that the elevated plain appeared to be part of a large farming field, as there were several isolated farming villages located around the valley. Rather than waste aviation fuel to fly out and assess the area, Colonel Gabriel instead chose to trust his XO's assessment and put him in charge of establishing the airfield. Within two hours, the Harriers and Rotorwing assets were taking off again, heading north towards the newly established airfield. Along with them, Gabriel ordered a security platoon of marines and a detachment of four of his eight 81mm mortars to bolster the marines already there. Unknown to Gabriel, however, the Mio was also under observation. Four cavalry scouts of Tupathica, now under the command of Legat Cornelius, had observed the invaders as they moved, noting that while their dragons were indeed fearful, they were also clumsy and difficult to control. They could not traverse over land as easily as the Legion's horses, and had extreme difficulty crossing rivers. This information would be vital to Legat Cornelius, and the Roman scout leader sent one of his riders back to Sibaris. There may yet be a way to defeat these invaders. The next morning, the Mew moved out again towards Sibari, crossing over the armoured vehicle launch bridge again at a narrow point in the river. They travelled unmolested for over an hour, until the first choke point appeared in the distance. This choke point was a narrow passageway about 20 metres wide, running approximately 100 metres long where the two rocky ridgelines met. Beyond the choke point, the ground opened up into wide grain fields. Colonel Gabriel halted his column seven kilometres west of the first choke point. The recon marines, which had been dropped in overwatch positions, reported that Roman forces had been arrayed in battle positions at the opposite side of the choke point. Again, the marines utilised their recon drones, and Colonel Gabriel was treated to a panoramic view of the Roman forces opposing him beyond the choke point. There were at least 10,000 Roman soldiers facing them, two legions arrayed in disciplined formations of combatants, while their cavalry was arranged behind them. On their flanks were large Scorpio heavy dart launchers, Onager quick-firing catapults and ballistae of every size. Then place the howitzers and set the mortar tubes of firing, ordered Gabriel. Prepare to drop rounds 100 metres in front of their vanguard. Now, unlike before, the Roman soldiers stood firm as the helicopters circled over their formation. However, as the artillery marines struggled to rapidly emplace their six-toed howitzers, one of the circling Venom helicopters transmitted a warning. Six, we have a column of Roman soldiers approaching your position from about a mile to your rear. They must have been camped out in the mountains to our north. They're coming at you with a dead run. Gabriel looked behind him, 
seeing nothing but the road bending around the mountain range which they just passed. The rear force of Roman soldiers had waited until the marines had rounded a long bend, using the mountain to mask their movements until the last second to get as close to the marines as possible. Still, that would have necessitated them to run at full speed to catch the invaders as they were stopped at the first choke point. The marine logistical and support elements were at the rear of the column, followed by a rear security detachment. Gabriel smiled. It was a classic hammer and anvil manoeuvre, with the Romans using their manoeuvrability to capitalise on the marines' limited movement ability in this terrain. Still, although the marines were outnumbered nearly eight to one, they still possessed overwhelming speed and firepower. Weapons free, weapons free. Gabriel said to his venom pilots, You're clear to fire, but fire only at the ground in front of them. I don't want any Roman casualties if we can help it. Roger, we're rolling hot. The two UH-1Y venom helicopters disappeared behind the ridge, diving low to fire on the advancing Roman legion, the hollow sounds of machine gun fire echoing across the hills. The two venom helicopters appeared again in the sky to the north, from behind the ridge, circling around for another path. No good, Six, said the lead Venom pilot. The few Legion soldiers who turned tail and ran were cut down by the guys behind them. Their cavalry is actually behind the Legion, herding them forwards. Roger, understand, said Gabriel, standing to one side of the column and scanning the rear of the column with his binoculars. The bend was about three-quarter miles behind the last vehicle in the Marine column. Give them another firing pass, but make sure you hit the ground in front of them. Once again, the helicopters dived towards the pursuing Roman soldiers, and the sounds of machine gun fire rattling sounded closer. The helicopters pulled up, circling to the south. They're not stopping, Six, announced the lead pilot. Sir, came a warning over the command radio net. It was a scout team leader watching the choke point. One of the legions is moving towards the choke point. Understood, scout, said Gabriel, switching channels to the combat net. Arch, the Legion is moving towards the choke point. Try to uh, dissuade them from engaging us. Make sure they don't block that passage. Roger Six, answered Colonel Wainwright. In seconds, the artillery and 81mm mortars barked, sending smoke grounds hurtling over the choke point to crash in front of the advancing Roman lines. To the Marines' rear, the security detachment leader radioed. First elements of the Roman Legion have rounded the bend. They're not slowing down. Stay rusty. Warning shots only, commanded Gabriel. The rear elements had by now turned their vehicles around, pointing the fifty caliber heavy machine guns back towards the way they came. Several of the machine guns barked, chewing up the ground in front of the charging Roman shoulders. But they came on regardless, boldly waving their gladius or spatha over their heads. A 40 millimeter automatic grenade launcher from the marine lines came alive with a chung chung chung, and high explosive rounds exploded in front of the Romans. But they still courageously pressed onwards, closing the distance with the invaders to only half a mile. In minutes, the marines would be in range of their archers. They're still pressing on, Six, reported the Venom pilot. We can only stay on station for a few more minutes before we go to critical on fuel and have to pull back to the airfield. Colonel Gabriel exhaled in fury. He cursed the entity for putting his marines in this situation. He cursed the entity for forcing those courageous Roman legion soldiers to charge bravely to their deaths. Before this is over, you son of a bitch, whispered Colonel Gabriel, thinking about the glowing entity claiming to be God. I'm going to kill you. His voice heavy with regret, Gabriel grabbed the radio mic and angrily yelled, Weapons free. Weapons free. Use of deadly force is authorized. Take them down. Take them down. But if their forces break, cease fire. Roger, I understand, said the Venom pilot with absolutely no enthusiasm whatsoever. Roll in hot. The two Venom helicopters dove on the Romans one last time from behind the marine lines and firing their four forward mounted machine guns while pods rained 70mm Hydra rockets down into the Roman ranks, cutting the exposed Roman soldiers down in droves. As the helicopters pulled up, 
the door gunners continued their firing, adding their mini-gun fire to the carnage. The two helicopters pulled up and turned north, making for the newly established airfield and leaving behind the bodies of nearly 200 dead or dying Roman soldiers scattered on the field. Still, despite the carnage which the Legion had just suffered, their losses were only a small handful of their total strength, and the Romans advanced even faster. The marines at the tail of the common opened fire at the sea of armour-clad Romans charging towards them. Five and a half miles to the east, artillery and mortar smoke rounds crashed in front of the main force of Roman soldiers, comprising two full legions. Unlike before, when the legion to Pathica faced the invaders, however, very few soldiers turned and ran as the billowing white smoke crashed before them, and those that did run were gutted by their comrades following behind. They aren't taking the hint, Six, reported the scouts at the choke point. The Romans are still moving to seal the choke point. Should we drop smoke again? Negative, responded Gabriel. We need to secure that choke point before they close it. Drop HE on their heavy weapons, I say again. Drop high explosive on their heavy weapons. Arch, let's get those tanks moving to the choke point. Seconds later... The unit's four M1A2 Abrams tanks roared forward towards the narrow choke point. Since anti-tank rounds would be virtually useless, the tanks were armed with a mix of high-explosive shells and anti-personnel rounds, a special shell designed to fire 1,100 tungsten steel balls into massed enemy formations. Behind the tanks came the wheeled LAV-25s with their 25mm Bushmaster cannons, and behind them rumbled the tracked amphibious AAVs filled with marine assault troopers. Beyond the choke points, the forward observer attached to the scouts methodically walked the artillery rounds towards the Legion's Scorpios, Onagers, and Ballistae, blasting them apart with every round that landed. Meanwhile, the 81mm mortars dropped amongst the Romans advancing towards the choke points, causing horrific casualties among the formations marching over open ground, but not slowing them down. Part 5 The passage was barely wide enough to allow two tanks to travel abreast as they charged into the opening, one tank slightly ahead of the other. A squared formation of Roman soldiers had closed to 300 metres to the mouth of the choke point when the lead tank fired its coaxial machine gun into the front rank, followed closely by the hollow whoosh of an anti-personnel round. A thousand tungsten steel balls screamed towards the Legion formation, devastating them as the lead tank burst through the other side, followed closely by another tank behind it. The second tank immediately swung its turret to the right, firing an anti-personnel round into the second formation of Roman soldiers at close range, vaporizing nearly fifty of them in an instant. The third tank emerged a second later, traversing its turret to the left and firing another anti-personnel round at the Roman formation closing from that direction. The fourth tank emerged from the gap, quickly joining the lead tank in firing round after round of anti-personnel shells into the masses of Roman soldiers who had advanced to close range. But instead of stopping to engage the legion, the tanks roared on, crushing dozens of Roman soldiers under their treads as they carried their momentum to the second Roman legion who had, as yet, not been engaged. Ten LAV 25s emerged from the gap shortly afterwards, their 25mm chain guns ripping ugly holes into the Roman ranks, still trying to valiantly reform after the punch which they'd taken from the tanks. And though the Roman legion far outnumbered the invaders, and had managed to rain thousands of arrows and slings against their terrible fire-breathing dragon beasts, no weapons which the Romans possessed seemed to stop them. Even when one of the legion's few surviving ballista struck one of the invaders' dragons head-on, it continued forwards as if it had never felt the powerful blow and continued to spew forth fire and death. So terrible and ferocious was the initial assault that the valiant men of Tupatica faltered and fell back as yet another type of demon emerged from the gap, these fearsome dragons opening up their rear ends and spewing out dozens of the giant green and brown-clad warrior invaders. And to add to the horror, two of the invaders' winged dragons had returned. The first harrier pulled up after dropping its payload of CBU cluster bomb units on the Roman legion which was attacking the marines from the rear, 
the bomb separating into hundreds of smaller bomblets which rained down over a wide area. The ground around the Legion attacking the Marines' rear flank literally erupted and exploded as the Harrier howled deafeningly overhead, blowing the Romans apart as they faithfully but fruitlessly pressed forwards. But the attack of the first fearsome dragon had hardly ended when a second one appeared behind the first, continuing the reign of death that the first dragon had begun. The sixteen Gemini's Legion Legat, Titus Lasius, had fallen along with the camp prefect in the fires of the first dragon attack. With the loss of their leadership, the second attack of the fearsome invaders' grey dragons caused the Legion to lose its nerve as the broken bodies of almost a thousand of their number littered the ground. For the second time, sixteen Germina turned and fled in the face of the invaders, none of their number getting any closer than a hundred metres to the marine lines. As instructed, the marines on rearguard stopped firing as soon as the Romans lost their nerve and ceased to a retreat. The marines quickly mounted back aboard their vehicles and cautiously made for the choke point. With marines now so close to the Roman lines on the far side of the choke point, Gabriel ordered a ceasefire of the artillery and mortars. The LAV 25s had widened the perimeter that the tanks had initially created, and the follow on Marines and the AAVs had formed a skirmish line, forming a perimeter which allowed the remainder of the truck borne ground combat element Marines to emerge from and to add their fires to the assault. Unable to breach the lines created by the invading warriors and their powerful black lances, which spit forth fire and death. The two Parthica finally broke. To their credit, however, the two Italica, which had yet to be committed to the battle and had withstood the pounding of the marine artillery, began advancing forwards on the marines, their cavalry leading the charge. However, rising above the charging Roman horsemen hovered four marine AH-1Z Vipers, their forward-mounted 20mm cannons firing. Colonel Gabriel stood in the middle of the smoking battlefield, looking around him with sadness at the carnage which the battle had wrought. His heart ached as he looked at the bodies of thousands of noble Roman soldiers littering an area of almost one square mile, many of the courageous warriors having fallen in disciplined formations. He felt sick to his stomach. There was no glory or honour in such a slaughter, and Colonel Gabriel's determination to bring low that goddamn thing calling itself God grew with every breath of air stained with the scent of blood and cordite that he took. The screams of hundreds of wounded and dying Roman soldiers filled the air, and though Gabriel's men were doing everything that they could to treat their grievous injuries, there were far too many wounded, more than his medical resources could treat. The fact that the Marines suffered no casualties outside of their typical scratches, bumps and bruises did little to quiet the screams in Gabriel's heart. Far too many of the Romans wounded. The only mercy which the Marines could offer was a quick round to the head to end their suffering. Before long, groups of Roman soldiers emerged from the surrounding tree line and began taking the field once again. They stood facing the Marines across the field of battle, first by the dozens, then hundreds. They stood still, with their shields stoically raised above their heads. None of them were armed. Arch, whispered Colonel Gabriel to his ground combat commander. What is that? Lieutenant Colonel Wainwright stood next to his Humvee, also observing the odd spectacle. It's the ancient Roman symbol of surrender, much like raising the white flag. Captain Tania Tonelli and Major Alexander Easter also stood next to Colonel Gabriel. I don't think they're surrendering, sir, said Captain Tonelli. I believe they're healers and physicians. They're asking for permission to treat their wounded. They'd taken a solemn oath to treat their injured warriors and would rather die than to break that oath. Gabriel nodded, lowering his head in shame and admiration at the courage of these Roman physicians and healers their loyalty to their wounded brethren mirrored by the loyalty of the Marine Corps itself. Let's leave them to their task, he whispered. Aerial recon revealed that there were no more legions in the area, and two hours later the 13th Mew consolidated again and pushed on unmolested to Sibari. Except for radio communications by the scouts, radio traffic was at a minimum, each Marine in the Mew seemingly lost in thought of the battle. Though many had seen combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, this one was different. 
It felt wrong, as if the Roman legions weren't the real enemy. Perhaps no one was more conflicted than Chaplain Johnson. Though his heart was telling him that the glorious entity on the hills was God, his head was telling him it was not. Discovering the entity's true identity was the key to solving everything that was happening. Chaplain Johnson was a servant of God, yet the God on the hill seemed to view Johnson with contempt. He spoke almost in fear of the prophecy of the Kohav Bahir, though Johnson had never heard of such a prophecy. The word sounded familiar. That was the key. Kohav Bahir was the key. For his part, Colonel Gabriel realized that the Romans had made a terrible tactical error. Instead of using one legion as the hammer and two legions as the anvil, the Romans should have allowed his marines to cross the choke point, using the one legion to close it off behind the marines, making that the anvil, while the two legions were the hammer. The outcome would have been the same, with the marines coming out victorious, but they would have been in more dire straits, and the Romans would have had a much better chance at inflicting casualties. The Mew was delayed twice, once when an AAV threw a track, and another when a Humvee overheated. News of the defeat of three legions had already spread rapidly, and the civilian population was fleeing before the invaders and their armoured dragons, which could shrug off the blows from the most powerful of the Rome's weapons. Still, there were a few brave souls who stood on cliffs and hilltops, fearfully hoping to catch a glimpse of the invaders and their beasts. Among them were the legion scouts. By early evening, the Mew had reached the outskirts of the city called Sibaris, which is modern-day Sibari. The main roadways led through the ancient city, and the people were still evacuating. As the entity promised, there were several blivets of aviation and diesel fuel located in a wide rolling farming field to the west of the city, along with pallets of heavy and small arms ammunition, as well as A and B ration meals. The Miu had travelled 150 miles, and as there would only about one hour of daylight left, Colonel Gabriel called a halt forming a night defensive position around the resupply and pushing out his security teams. As his marines worked into the night breaking down pallets and replenishing their stores, the cooks got to work setting up their field kitchens to prepare a hot meal. Mechanics and crews were also busy getting their vehicles fully mission capable, working under spotlights hooked to portable generators while the mortar teams in place their tubes, readying them to fire illumination rounds throughout the night. At his Humvee, Chaplain Johnson and his chaplain's assistant held an impromptu service which was attended by an unusually large number of Marines. Colonel Gabriel called Colonel Lively at the forward airfield, informing him of the day's battle and of his intention to remain at their current positions for the next few days. Priority would be vehicle maintenance, consolidation of the airfield, and extensive reconnaissance for the push to Potenza a hundred miles to the northwest. The ground would be more open, with the rivers Agri and Basento needing to be crossed. Finally, he told Lively to have the Mews four attached CH-53 Super Stallions ready for launch in the morning, as they'd have to pick up the tents for the airfield and the much-needed aviation fuel that was here at Sibari. Emperor Tiberius read the report once again, about the twentieth time since he and his entourage had abandoned their positions and begun the trip back to Rome. The reports from his scouts about the invaders' conduct of battle were as disheartening as they were intriguing. All totaled, the three Roman legions faced the invaders with 15,000 soldiers. However, though the invaders' numbers were woefully inferior to that of the legions, the almost godlike powers of the invaders had proven that the forces of the legion were woefully inadequate. Rome's forces were soundly defeated. Still, before the invaders unleashed their terrible beasts on his legions, they first gave them a demonstration of their weapons' awesome powers. Had his forces fled as they had on the beaches of Regium, Tiberius knew that the invaders wouldn't have pressed their attack against his legions. The invaders had been forced into battle just as Tiberius had planned. Given all of the information that had been reported by his most trusted scouts and field commanders, Emperor Tiberius was forced to come to a most shocking conclusion. His enemies, the invaders, had acted with the highest of honour, displaying not only great power but great restraint and mercy. Of his 15,000 soldiers, only 6,000 had been lost, either killed or wounded. 
Not only did the invaders choose not to destroy the entirety of his legions, the invaders had attempted to heal the Roman wounded, even allowing his Roman healers to tend to the injured unmolested. The invaders could have destroyed all three of his legions. They had chosen not to do so, allowing them to retreat and regroup and treat their wounded. Emperor Tiberius was struggling with one thought that was haunting him ever since God had ordered him to destroy the invaders who threatened the Roman Empire. By all evidence, the invaders didn't want to wage war with Rome at all. The invaders had only attacked when the legions had forced them into aggression. The thought that God had instructed him to defend the empire against such a noble foe greatly disturbed the Roman emperor. Tiberius was also loath to admit that it was a mistake for him to have taken personal command of the three legions away from his more experienced commander, Imperial Legate Flavius Aetius, who was originally in overall command of sixteen Gemina, two Parthica and two Italica. After the first battle with the invaders, Tiberius returned command of what remained of his decimated legions to Aetius, ordering him to consolidate their forces and form the defences around Neapolis as quickly as possible. The Mew had to deviate from their course by twenty kilometres to find a narrow enough crossing to ford the river Agri. The scouts had discovered a stout and well-constructed stone bridge which could support the weight of most of the marine vehicles. The AAVs forded the river as the wheeled vehicles crossed over the bridge. Colonel Gabriel did not trust the bridge to hold the weight of his tanks. The M1A2 tanks could ford to a depth of six feet, so Gabriel sent his scouts to find a spot shallow enough for the crossing of the Agri. Two hours later, his scouts reported that they'd found a shallow enough crossing about five feet deep and one hundred metres wide, but somewhere in the middle of the ford, the depth dropped to eight feet. It was decided to have the tanks cross the ford until it dropped, then deploy the AVLB track to launch the bridge to cover the gap. Except for the tanks, the rest of the Mew had crossed the Agri River. Gabriel stood on the far bank, watching with binoculars the crossing operation of his tanks. His ground combat commander, Colonel Wainwright, by his side. The AVLB had successfully launched and had bridged the gap, though the bridge was five feet underwater. Each tank was to cross individually, with guides stationed on each bank. Collapsible markers marked the centre of the scissor bridge, and the tank commander of the first tank stood on the front hull of the Abrams, looking down and acting as a second pair of eyes for the nervous driver who was slowly driving into the flowing water. Agonizingly slowly, the first tank reached the spot where the armoured launch bridge had been positioned and tentatively began the crossing, the waters of the Agri splashing over the front hull and into the driver's compartment. Still, the tank continued forwards and succeeded in making it across the bridge. Minutes later, to the relief of the tank crew, the soaking wet Abrams tank emerged on the opposite bank of the Agri River just as the second tank entered the water behind it. It was when the third tank entered the water when the pilot of a circling Viper helicopter warned, Six, we got company. Roman catapults and cavalry approaching from your south, about two clicks out. Gabriel raised his binoculars, seeing the low hill which they crossed that hid the Romans from his line of sight. I don't have eyes on target. How many cavalry? How many catapults? We're looking at a few hundred cavalry and about ten catapults, reported the Viper pilot. Roger said Gabriel into the radio. Break, break, break. Archer 4, Archer 4. Colonel Gabriel radioed the last remaining tank still on the far side of the river. Get back up the hill and engage the Roman catapults, said Gabriel. I say again, just target the catapults. Roger, came the response. We are moving. Archer 4 spun around and the tank raced back the way they'd come, easily climbing up the gentle slope of the hill. Gabriel turned to his combat commander. Arch. Mortars? asked Colonel Wainwright. Yes, said Gabriel. On the way, said Wainwright. Part 6. With the Viber helicopter acting as the forward observer, the mortars fired a few adjustment rounds over the hill to mark the targets before finally dropping the Marines' new, non-lethal indirect fire munition around that disperses flashbang submunitions over a wide area to temporarily stun and daze people. The rounds fell amongst the charging Roman cavalry with a devastating effect, 
terrifying both horse and riders. The concussive force of the munitions, coupled with their ear-shattering blast noise that accompanied it, scattered the charging cavalry, horses rearing up in fear and tossing their riders to the ground. In minutes, the charge had fallen apart as the Abrams tank, now at the top of the hill, began belching smoke and fire. One by one, 120mm high explosive rounds smashed into the Roman trebuchets, which the Viper pilot had mistakenly identified as catapults. The Roman soldiers and horses, which had been struggling to bring their mighty weapons to bear against the invaders, fled in terror as soon as the first two trebuchets had been smashed seemingly by the hand of the powerful dragon which stood upon the hill before them. It took only minutes for the invaders to smash the Roman cavalry and heavy weapons, even though most of the invaders never even laid an eye on the Roman attackers. And despite the power of the invaders, which broke their attack and injured many Roman soldiers, not one of them had lost their lives two hours later. A thirteenth mew was on the bank of the Basento River, two wide and well-built bridges capable of supporting the weight of Gabriel's tanks spanning the water. And positioned in the rolling fields before the marines stood formations of thousands of Roman soldiers. The Romans stood stoically, unit pennants flying in the breeze, almost defiantly daring the invaders to cross. Once again the mortars were in place for firing while the artillery battery also unhooked from their trucks, their tubes facing almost straight up as the Romans were only two miles away. Gabriel had his tanks at the foot of the two bridges to provide fire support and arrayed his LAV-25s and AAVs to cross the two bridges. Imperial Legat Gaius Marius, commander of Legion 16 Gallica, and the Legion 8 Macedonia, 10,000 soldiers in all, studied the invaders from his chariots. They were of smaller number than his men, just as the scouts had reported, but their dragon beasts looked fearsome indeed, no matter what size they were, and they chewed up the ground over which they walked. But nothing seemed more fearful than the flying dragons and locusts which circled the invaders protectively overhead. Still, the reports from the healers said the invaders were behaving strangely, showing mercy, even kindness to those Roman soldiers who had been wounded in battle, treating them with strange poultices, medicines and bandages to stop bleeding and save lives. And of the civilians, the invaders neither slaughtered nor took slaves or demanded ransom, instead allowing them to leave unmolested ere they crossed the land. The invaders made displays of power to the legions which opposed them, as if in warning that they did not wish to fight, but would defend themselves if attacked. The Imperial Legat Gaius Marius knew he was taking a big chance, and he prayed he was not wrong. He knew that his decision was a fatal one for him, but he was a dead man anyway, after he'd made up his mind. It was the lives of his men which concerned him. From the bridges the dragons roared and rumbled across, moving faster than Marius could ever have imagined. Behind them the invaders called upon their thunder weapons as the great grey flying dragons and locusts dived upon his formations. Meanwhile, the ground two hundred metres in front of his forward formations erupted with noise and explosions, as if an army of volcanoes were being formed right in front of the legions. Many of his men faltered at the power of the gods. Stand your ground, yelled Marius. Stand your ground. Show these invaders that neither smoke nor noise nor even dragon will shake the hearts of the men of Rome. Hiya! Marius raised his spear above his head shaking it in defiance. His legions did the same, and a loud roaring like that of a lion raged back at the marines. Let these invaders know that they shall not cross this land without our permission. Once again the legions roared in defiance. Two of the invaders' giant flying locusts hovered in front of the legion commander, but Marius stood unmoving, staring defiantly back. Filled with both fear and defiance, Marius pointed his spear at them, yelling, Go back, locusts! You shall find no fear in these hearts. And then the locusts turned and flew back to where the invaders were positioned across the river. The dragons were still approaching, but they'd slowed once they'd crossed the river over the bridge. Imperial Legat, Gaius Marius, called to his trumpeters and signals captains. Signal the legion commanders, he ordered. Tell them to retire their men from the field. 
The ringing sound of trumpets signalling the legions to withdraw blared across the field, and in very disciplined order, the formations of Roman soldiers marched to the left and to the right of the field, creating a wide path through which the invaders could pass into the valley beyond. Imperial legat Gaius Marius, said Marius' shocked second-in-command, Bidinus Pedophilus. What are you doing? This is not what we planned. Marius turned to look at Pedophilus, waving his hand in a sweeping motion towards the low hill surrounding what was to be the battlefield. Hold your tongue, Tribune Bidinus Pedophilus. Look around you, at the hills, commanded Marius. Tribune Batophilus, a politician and not a warrior, did as he was told, seeing that thousands of civilians, mostly women, children, and the elderly, had assembled on the hills. They were looking down at the legions, looks of worry and despair on many of their faces. The men of the legions come from this area, said Marius. Those people shall not see their husbands, fathers, and sons die on the field today. This decision will mean your life, Marius, said Pedophilus. This is treason. Marius looked across the field. The invaders' dragons had stopped, just as he had expected. From behind the large dragons, a smaller sand-coloured dragon crossed the bridge and approached his chariot. So be it, then. My life is a small price to pay for the lives of my legion. Imperial Legat Gaius Marius stood confidently upon his chariot as its driver held the horse to a slow gallop towards the invaders. Marius was flanked to his left by a chariot where rode his tribune, the legion's second-in-command, and a chariot to the right ridden by his camp prefect, the legion's third-in-command. Though outwardly Legat Marius displayed an air of regal confidence, inside of him his rapidly beating heart hinted at a tinge of self-doubt. What if he was wrong about the invaders? What if they were barbaric animals after all, and this was a trick to cut the head from the snake? The dragon beast separated from its brethren and rumbled slowly towards the Roman commanders. It was smaller than the others, and its colour was like that of sand. It matched the pace of Marius's chariots and stopped in the middle of the field. As Legat Marius's chariot slowly closed the gap, the dragon opened four of its mouths, and from it stepped four of the invaders, each clothed in their fearsome green and brown clothing, just as the reports had described, but none carrying the dreadful black lances that spit fire and death. Marius's eyes narrowed as he realised that the dragon wasn't a dragon at all, but rather a strange mechanism which the invaders relied on for their transportation, and the invaders, while taller than most Romans, were not giants, but humans. Marius studied the four invaders, who had emerged from their strange contraption, which needed no horses to power it, as they walked slowly towards him. He ordered his chariots to halt, and he stepped down. Flanked by his tribune and camp prefect, Marius strode towards the four invaders. Three of them were men and one a woman. What is this? The invaders count women among their number of warriors. The sight stunned Marius, but he did his best not to show it. He approached the one invader who stepped forward, the invader's eyes and forehead bearing the familiar wrinkles that come with commanding warriors in battle. The invader removed his helmet, revealing a head of short grey hair, framing a wrinkled brow heavy with responsibility. Marius removed his own helmet, also revealing a head of short grey hair, framing a wrinkled brow heavy with responsibility. Legatus Augusti Pro Praetore Gaius Marius, said the Imperial Legat. Colonel Solomon Gabriel, 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit, United States Marine Corps, replied the invader. We did not know what strange tongue he spoke. Marius assumed that the invader had given him his name and the name of his mighty warrior. Colonel Solomon Gabriel, said Marius. Miserere, Deus Pugnarent Dies. Colonel Gabriel turned to his right where Chaplain Johnson stood. Jabs, care to a uh, hobbler what this gentleman just said? I'm a little rusty on my Latin, sir, said Chaplain Johnson, 
but I believe he's asking for mercy for his men. He added that only gods should fight gods. Colonel Gabriel tightened his lips, nodding to the Roman legion commander. Miserere, Gabriel said. Um, does anyone know anything appropriate to say in Latin? said the one called Colonel Solomon Gabriel. You already know the perfect thing to say, sir, said the woman warrior. Colonel Gabriel smiled. I believe you're right, Captain Tonelli. Then, coming to attention, Colonel Gabriel saluted the Roman Legion commander, for he outranked the Marine colonel. Semper Fidelis he said. Imperial Legard Gaius Marius nodded and smiled. Saluting the invader, Marius responded with, Semper Fidelis. The two commanders parted ways and returned to their respective units, and that is how the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit crossed the Basento River Valley and passed the positions held by the Legion 16 Gallica and the Legion 8 Macedonia, without loss of lives on either side. By morning of the next day, the Mew had left the last of the Apennine mountain ranges behind them and crossed into Potenza, and the valley where Lieutenant Colonel Brad Lively had established the airfield. For Colonel Gabriel, it was good to have his unit back together in one place, though it would be a temporary arrangement. They have at least one legion to the northwest of our current position, reported Colonel Lively that morning to Colonel Gabriel. They've taken up blocking positions on all of the main roads leading to Naples. they also got several cavalry units surrounding us, though they haven't come closer to us than one mile. They're probably keeping us under observation. Oh, not much we can do to stop that, said Gabriel. Good job setting up the airfield, Brad, but, but after we find a suitable location north of Naples, I'm afraid you'll have to pull up stakes and move again. Just let me know when, sir, answered Colonel Light. Marius has failed us, my liege, said Senator Furius Camulus, handing Emperor Tiberius the scroll brought by the rider. Tiberius threw the scroll away in rage. He retired from the field without engaging the invaders, yelled Tiberius. If word of this treason reaches the other legions, they may also follow suit. Has Marius been dealt with? Yes, my liege, said Camulus. He has been placed under arrest, and the Tribune Bidenis Pedophilus now leads the two legions. Ah, rid me of that fondling fool, said Tiberius. Pedophilus is no leader of warriors. Have the commander of Legion 16 Gallica take command of both legions. Have them pursue the invaders, and if the invaders mean to take Neapolis, then 16 Gallica and 8 Macedonia will strike them from the east. Yes, my lead said Camelus. Also, said Tiberius, send word to recall the legions 17 and 18 and 22 Primigenia from Germania and 3 Italica from Rome. Tell them to make haste to Neapolis. They will strike from the north. Finally, alert legion 22 Deotania in Egypt to start movement from the south towards Neapolis. Should we also recall Legion 10 Fratensis from Jerusalem and Legion 6 Ferrata from Galilee as well to bolster the attack from the south? said Camillus. Emperor Tiberius rubbed his chin. No, not yet. Not unless the tide of war turns against us. For now we shall leave those legions in the land of the Jews. The next couple of days, Colonel Gabriel sent his scouts out again, this time to recon a site at what is now modern-day Benevento, fifty miles northwest of the 13th Mew's current location, which they could use to establish a forward firing base that could cover the approaches to Naples to the west and Salerno to the south. This fire base would be the jumping-off point for the Marines as they made their final push to Rome. Part 7 After two days, the scouts had located several positions to the west, which may have been tactically feasible as a fire base. Instead of ordering his XO to establish the firebase, Colonel Gabriel went out himself aboard an Osprey with a security squad of Marines to recon the potential sites. By the end of the third day, the last of the five sites which Gabriel surveyed turned out to be the best. It was located atop a relatively flat but rocky ridgeline south of Benevento, 
where three major roads intersected with Naples to the west and Salerno to the south. His plan was to have his engineers use their dump trucks and bulldozers to build the road which would lead from the road up to the firebase. Meanwhile, he would airlift three of his six howitzers, along with four of his eight 81mm mortars, and a company of infantry for security, to the top of the ridge where they would keep overwatch of the roads, as well as the engineers who would be constructing the road to the firebase. On the morning of the fourth day since their last encounter with the Roman legions, the Marine Security Company and the mortars had been airlifted to the site of the new firebase and were given instructions to prepare the site for the arrival of the three howitzers. Meanwhile... The ground element of engineers, scouts, and a security element of LAV-25s and armoured Humvees departed the airfield for the new firebase over 50 miles away. Late in the morning, the marine convoy was stopped as it travelled down a narrow road through a rocky hillside. In front of the lead scout vehicle lay a Roman soldier, his neck broken when the horse he was riding on threw him. The Roman soldier had been pushing his horse hard as they charged down the roadway. As they turned the corner of the hillside, they came face to face with one of the invaders' small dragons. The horse had reared up in fear, tossing its rider, then sprinting up the embankment, disappearing into the field on the other side. The scout marine slammed on the brakes of his armoured Humvee as soon as the rider rounded the corner. He stood over the body of the dead Roman soldier, who looked to only be in his mid-teens. "'I'm sorry. I'm so sorry,' said the young marine." a private first class by the name of Hendrik. He knelt over the young Roman soldier's body. Oh, he came around the corner so fast I didn't see him in time. Nothing you could have done about it, Hendrik, said his squad leader, a sergeant by the name of Ellis, who was standing next to PFC Hedrick. The way he was pushing his horse, he was probably a messenger. Look, he has a leather messenger pouch over his shoulders. Hedrick, he didn't do anything wrong. He just came around the corner and... An arrow penetrated Sergeant Ellis's throat just above the neckline of his body armor. The Marine Scout team leader jerked up and fell backwards onto the rocky ground. Sergeant Ellis! screamed PFC Hedrick, just as two arrows hit him, one bouncing off his frontal body armor and one penetrating his left arm. Hedrick grabbed his left arm, yelling in pain as a second arrow hit him square in the face. PFC Hedrick fell backwards, his body lying motionless next to that of his squad leader. In the fields to the right of the Marines and the hills in front of them, hundreds of Rome's finest archers emerged, having camouflaged themselves by hiding patiently under sheets dyed green and brown. They stood up and rained arrow after arrow upon the invaders and their fearsome dragon beasts. Marine gunners on the vehicle spun their turrets and immediately returned fire with machine gun, 40mm grenade, 25mm chain gun, and small arms fire, swallowing the Roman archers in a cacophony of deadly explosive firepower. The Viper and Venom Hunter Killer helicopters, which had been circling overhead, dived towards the Roman ambush, the Viper vengefully firing its entire payload of rockets into the Roman archers facing the Marine convoy, while the Venom rained the field next to the Marines in machine gun fire. Only moments later, after the Romans had initiated their ambush, it was over. The positions in which they had been hiding, now shrouded in smoke and fire, and littered with the dead and dying bodies of the courageous Roman archers, who knew that, by the time Apollo had ended his trek across the sky, they would indeed be dining with Hades tonight. Medical evacuation helicopters arrived to take the six marines who had been wounded by the Roman arrows that had found the gaps in the marine body armour. Fortunately, though their wounds were painful, they were not life-threatening. With the bodies of PFC Hedrick and Sergeant Ellis, the wounded marines were airlifted to the aid station back at the airfield, along with the scroll which the Roman scout had been carrying. Soon the marines were on the move again, the radio silent as they mourned the deaths of two of their courageous scouts. Lieutenant Gabriel sat alone at his desk in the top, blaming himself for the loss of his two recon marines. Of his entire mew, he had pushed his scouts the most. What could he tell to Sergeant Ellis and Private Hedrick's family? How could he tell them that their marines died in the service of a country... That hasn't been founded for nearly 2,000 years. 
And though he was proud that his marines did everything that they could to treat the wounded Roman archers who had ambushed the convoy, Gabriel's rage against the entity that had brought them here was growing with every second they were trapped in the past. Sir, said Captain Tonelli as she and Chaplain Johnson entered the top. I have it here. Well, that was fast, said Gabriel. Well, between me, uh, Chaplain Johnson, and the three privates who we found that are taking college classes in ancient languages and cultures, we were able to translate the scroll that was recovered from the dead Roman scout. Chaplain Johnson set a canteen of fresh brewed coffee in front of Colonel Gabriel. You really should have something to eat, sir, said Chaplain Johnson. I haven't seen you eat in days. Later, chaps, said Gabriel. Okay, Tanya, spill it. What you got? They're movement orders, said Captain Tonelli. They're signed by Emperor Tiberius himself. Hmm, should be worth a fortune on eBay, said Gabriel with no humor in his voice as he took the scroll from Captain Tonelli. Go on, Captain. Yes, sir, answered Captain Tonelli. What we believe the scroll says is that Emperor Tiberius has recalled three Roman legions from Germany and one from northern Italy. Uh, they're setting a trap for us at Naples, planning to hit us with three legions attacking from the north, two to our west, two to the east, and one legion recalled from Egypt to hit us from the south. Hmm, said Gabriel. That's 40,000 to 2,000. We should be honored that the Romans think so highly of us. I take it the two legions attacking from the west are the two legions that let us pass in the Vicento River. Does the scroll say anything about what happened to their commander Marius? Only that he's been arrested, sir, replied Chaplain Johnson. The last part of the message says that the Roman legions garrisoned in the Holy Lands will remain in place pending the results of the coming battle. I see, said Gabriel. Well, I'm assuming that multiple messages have been sent out to the separate legions, so one of them isn't going to get it. Still... Gabriel paused, looking at the map. Let's get the command and staff here. Okay, here's what we got, started Gabriel as his command and staff officers had arrived in the talk. Tiberius is planning to commit at least eight legions against us in the open plains east of Naples. It's a good plan tactically to engage us in force far from Rome. Now, the entity wanted us to destroy the legions of Rome within forty days. I told it that we stand at the gates of Rome until the forty days is up. It was my intent to avoid combat as much as possible, but it appears that Emperor Tiberius is forcing our hand again. Do you think that Tiberius is working with the Entity? asked CSM Tunstall. To destroy his own military? said Gabriel. I don't think so. But I'm still going with the assumption that the Entity is playing us and the Empire against each other. But it's still a mystery why it wants the Roman Legion is destroyed. I don't think it matters to the entity where the legions are destroyed, as long as they are, said Major Alexander Easter. That entity is pulling all the strings here. I agree, said Gabriel, but we aren't going to play his games anymore. I don't know what's supposed to happen when the 40 days is up. We aren't going to be doing our part in preventing some prophecy from occurring. Gabriel then pointed at the map. Changing the operations plan, folks. I'm moving up the timetable of our move to the new site to tomorrow. It's a more defendable position than our current location, and because it's at a major crossroads, we can hit the bridges and overpasses that the legions will have to cross. Once we establish the firebase and the airfields, we go over to the defensive, using air and artillery to interdict any Roman formations. Hey, Air 6, what's our fuel and POL status? Currently, we're at about 75% motor gas, about 3,000 gallons. We're down to 50% fuel for the generators and 60% aviation fuel, answered the S-6 supply officer. By the time we establish the new position, we'll be critical on fuel and POL. Colonel Gabriel nodded. I understand. What about Class 1 supplies? Currently you have a week to ten days of MREs and rations, but only about a week of potable water, answered the supply officer. The water purification unit is operational, however, so if there's a water source at the new site, we should be good. Colonel Gabriel, said Colonel Arch Wainwright, we're going to need a resupply once we get there. That means we'll have to trust the entity to make good on his promises. 
I know, Arch, conceded Gabriel, but I'm betting that the entity needs us more than we need it. The Marines worked through the night breaking down the airfield, loading supplies and equipment onto vehicles, and breaking down tents in preparation for the morning's movement to the new location. At first light, the first chalks of helicopter flights airlifted the 1st Marine Infantry Company to the new Ford operating base, along with the remainder of the 155mm howitzers and their crews. Upon arrival at the new firebase, the Marine Infantry Company secured the designated landing zones, and those aircraft not directly involved with convoy security flew to the new site. Meanwhile, the remaining Marines rolled out of the airfield, headed for the new forward operating base over 50 miles away. The convoy road march to the new site went unmolested by the Romans, the only delays coming from vehicle breakdowns which had to be towed, and by late afternoon, the Marines moved to the new location had been completed. Part 8 There was none of the resupply that the entity had promised at the new site, as it had been in Sibari over a week ago. Still, Colonel Gabriel couldn't allow that from stopping him from establishing the now consolidated operating base, though they would have to ration the use of Morgus, and especially GP-8 aviation fuel, which they were down to less than 35%. To limit the movement of the legions, Gabriel and his harriers and engineers blew all of the bridges to the southern and eastern approaches within a five-mile perimeter of the base, leaving only the three larger bridge crossings to the northwest of his position leading to Naples. It took two days for his engineers to create and improve the hard-packed road which led up a gentle 300-meter slope to the main firebase located on a commanding position 50 meters on the top of the ridge. At the base of the ridge, where the engineers had constructed the road, Gabriel had designated it as the airfield, where his air assets would be launching. Two streams ran parallel to each other on the base's southeastern perimeter, where the water purification marines busily began restocking the Mew's 500-gallon water containers. By limiting and conserving fuel usage, Major Alexander Easter, the operations officer, estimated that the Mew had a week to ten days of fuel left, assuming that the marines went over to the defence. Gabriel hated giving up the initiative to the Romans, as it allowed them to manoeuvre and consolidate their forces, and Gabriel had no doubt that was exactly what the entity wanted to happen. It was pulling the strings, which would force one climactic encounter between his marines and the Roman legions. Still, Gabriel once again sent out platoons of marines to scour the surrounding countryside, looking to see if they could find any signs of the entity leaving a resupply depot. After two days of searching, in which time the Marines were consolidating and improving their defensive positions, it became apparent that there was no resupply to be found. Although the patrolling Marines did report heavy Roman movement to the west and south, and especially north, where the legions were looking to consolidate in south Naples, already they were either bypassing or repairing the bridges which had been blown. By Major Easter's estimation, They'd be in South Naples and ready to move against the Marines in about one week's time, when the Marines would be critical in fuel. Six days later, Colonel Gabriel and Lieutenant Colonel Wainwright, the ground combat commander, were in a UH-1 Venom helicopter, circling the rolling flatlands four miles west of their position. Oh, that son of a bitch, that damn glow-in-the-dark son of a bitch. Below them was a massive supply depot that had appeared overnight with pallets of fuel, POL, stores, munitions and rations, enough to sustain the 13th Mew for weeks. The process to transport the supply depot would probably take a few days, even using their air assets. The problem was the entity had left the supply depot behind the lines of six full Roman legions, a force of over 30,000 soldiers. If the Marines wanted it, they'd have to come and take it from the Romans. Arch, said Gabriel. What do you think? Can you secure it? Maybe, said Colonel Wainwright. But it'll take every Marine we can spare that can carry a weapon. Oh, we'll need to be quick. We need to be violent. We'll need to use every weapon at our disposal. And, sir, we cannot afford to show mercy. There'll be lots of casualties on both sides. Gabriel nodded silently watching as the supplies which his marines sorely needed rotated below his orbiting helicopter. 
Sir, said Wainwright, I don't like it that the entity is calling the shots, bending and twisting circumstances to fit his needs. First chance we get, I want permission to engage and kill it. Permission denied, said Gabriel. If that opportunity arises, I reserve the honor of ventilating that reject from ancient big a creepy pasta myself. The last of all, the available aviation fuel was fed into the Harrier jump jets and the Viper and Venom helicopters, which would be participating in the assault. What was left over was put into the Ospreys and Sea Stallions. Their rear ramps dropped to allow a 50 cal machine gunner to fire out of the back. Their mission was to hit all of the Roman heavy siege weapons, which had been lined in three rows, each row a half mile long and facing the charging marines. As usual, the M1A2 Abrams tanks would lead the assault, followed by the Lav 25s and the AAVs. These would be followed closely by armoured Humvees mounting miniguns or heavy machine guns, and these, in turn, were followed by seven ton trucks loaded with two companies of infantry who would secure the supply depot. Meanwhile, the full complement of the Marines' artillery and mortars would hit the Roman lines to clear a path to the supplies. No warning shots this time. The indirect fire Marines set the fuses of their high-explosive rounds to air burst, which would cause them to explode over the heads of the Romans, inflicting the widest casualties over the widest area. Meanwhile, the tanks and LAV-25s were to hit the front lines of the Roman legions with everything that they had including the dreaded anti-personnel rounds, punching holes into their ranks as quickly and violently as possible. Gabriel hoped that a quick, massive display of overwhelming firepower would shatter the legions' will to resist and cause them to flee. Though this would regretfully cause a massive amount of casualties to the Romans, their casualties would be far lighter than if the battle were allowed to be reduced to a protracted battle of attrition. Normally, for a battle this size, Gabriel would be in the air in his own command and control helicopter. Instead, he chose an elevated spot on the ground to observe the battle, allowing that fuel to put another gunship in the air. The three bridges spanning the Beneventanto River, each stout enough to hold the weight of his tanks, was one mile down the ridge to his southwest. The Roman legions were arrayed in the fields to the west of the bridges, only three miles away. The entire battlefield could be observed from Gabriel's vantage point. Chaplain Johnson and his chaplain's assistant sat in their Humvee, having no part to play in the coming battle. Something was eating at the chaplain. Though everything about the Marines being transported to biblical times felt wrong, there was something particularly troubling about this day, and especially this climactic battle. Johnson rubbed his forehead. He was tired. He hadn't had any sleep, and had been living on coffee for the past few days. Kohav Bahir, Kohav Bahir, said Chaplain Johnson. What is that? That's not Latin. It's not modern-day Italian. Almost sounds like Hebrew. If only he'd studied up more on his ancient Hebrew. You're right, sir, said Lance Corporal Recupero, Johnson's chaplain assistant. It does sound Hebrew. Sort of like when we were at Bright Star. Chaplain Johnson thought back, remembering how he'd taken a long, dreamed-of trip to Jerusalem last year after the 13th Mew participated in an annual joint training exercise with the Egyptian military named Operation Bright Star. Bright Star? That's it! Chaplain Johnson jumped with excitement at recalling. The Israeli soldiers, who'd been our tour guys, called Operation Bright Star Kohav Bahir. Chaplain Johnson's mind was racing. Okay, so it's the prophecy of the bright star. The bright star was the star of Bethlehem, which signaled the birth of the Christ child who is Jesus, who was destined to walk with man and be crucified by the Romans. Then, after three days, he would rise in fulfillment of the scriptures. <laughs> That's it. The entity is trying to stop the crucifixion of Jesus by removing Rome from the Holy Land. The Roman garrison in Jerusalem leaves to defend Rome against the Marines and therefore does not order and carry out the crucifixion of the Christ. The Christ is not crucified as is written in the books of the New Testament and therefore does not rise again in three days, thus nullifying the prophecy of the Gohav Bahir, the bright star which led the three wise men to the birthplace of the Christ. 
with the prophecy unfulfilled, the rise of the Judeo-Christian faith never occurs, and the worship of the Roman god Jupiter will continue into the future. Ironically, for the being known as Jupiter to survive, the man called Jesus must not fulfill the ancient Jewish prophecy by dying. The destruction of the Roman legions by the Mew will be a small price to pay for a dying god like Jupiter who needs the worship of his land to survive. Startled by this new revelation, Chaplain Johnson jumped out of his Humvee and ran towards where Colonel Gabriel had set up his command post to observe the coming battle, where the ground combat element was waiting for the green light to go weapons free. Oh, I don't have time for this, chaps, yelled Colonel Gabriel. I got the entire Roman army closing in on my marines. Sir, yelled Chaplain Johnson, you have to pull our marines back. You need to retreat. What are you talking about? responded Gabriel angrily. If we give up the initiative now, we may not get it back. Don't you make me choke murder you, Brent. Colonel Gabriel, said Chaplain Johnson, the prophecy the entity was talking about refers to the crucifixion of Christ. At the end of forty days, the man who is now in Jerusalem named Jesus will be put to death by the Romans for treason. Three days after that, he'll rise again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He then sent out his disciples across the known world, and a new religion will be born, one which will completely destroy the entire pantheon of Roman gods. <laughs> if we destroy the legions here... Emperor Tiberius is forced to recall the Romans from Jerusalem, and Jesus never gets crucified. Thus the prophecy never happens, answered Colonel Gabriel. Is that what you're saying, chaps? Yes, sir, answered Chaplain Johnson. And if the prophecy never happens, that son of a bitch who kidnapped us remains in power, said Gabriel, anger etched on his face. Yeah, that's correct, sir, said Johnson. Okay, chaps, what if I pull my marines back, said Gabriel. What if we cease operations right now and I tell the entity to go screw himself? Is your guard going to return my marines back to where they belong? I don't... I can't answer that, sir, admitted the chaplain. All I can tell you, sir, is that if Jesus dies, the entity also dies. But Jesus rises again, the entity doesn't. Gabriel looked down at the battlefield. His marines had crossed the bridges and were arraying themselves to assault into the legion's first battle lines as soon as the artillery lifted. The supplies that the marines so badly needed lay only half a mile behind the legion's positions. I can't believe I'm doing this, chaps, said Colonel Gabriel. I hope you're right, Brent. Colonel Gabriel got on the radio battle net. Colonel Wainwright, Arch, recall the attack. I say again, retreat. Pull our marines back across the bridge. Gabriel then switched the radio to his air command net. Break, break, break. Wait until the last marine crosses back over the bridge to our side, then blow it up. He ordered his AV-8 Harriers circling overhead. I say again, wait until the last marine crosses over the bridge, then blow it up. Switching to the artillery network, he ordered his artillery commander, Thunder, 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 when we blow the bridge, I need your red legs to drop ordnance on our supply. I say again, hit our resupply once the bridge is down. Gabriel dropped the radio hand mic and turned to Chaplain Johnson. When you get a chance, chaps, tell Jesus he owes us a favor. He put his binoculars to his eyes, watching as his marines were already falling back across the bridge, his Harrier pilots arming their paveway bombs in order to collapse the bridge once the last marine element had crossed. Next to Gabriel, the artillery marines were adjusting the tubes of their howitzers, preparing to hit the resupply depot with high explosive rounds as soon as the Harriers dropped the bridge. The legions had stopped advancing, the Roman soldiers cheering in victorious relief as the invaders withdrew. Their prayers to their gods had been answered. The deity known as Jupiter screamed with anger and rage, realizing that he'd chosen very unwisely. Yes, the U.S. Marines were deadly warriors. Yes, the U.S. Marines were the most elite fighters of their time. But the Marines were also honorable. The Marines were virtuous. Worse, the Marines had proven that they had the ability and the character to think and act for themselves, 
loyal as they were to the accursed U.S. Constitution and dedication to their esprit de corps. The Marines had completely destroyed the carefully laid plans of the entire pantheon of Roman gods. And Jupiter would not make the same mistake again. There were still a few days before the prophecy of the Kohav Bahir would be fulfilled. The man who was Jesus the Christ still had not been crucified, as was foretold in the scriptures. There was still time to prevent his crucifixion, and thus prevent his resurrection. For with the rising of the Christ from death, the very pillars of the pantheon of Greek and Roman gods would crumble and collapse, awakening the world to the knowledge of the one true God. This must not be allowed to happen, and though Jupiter knew that what he was about to do would drain his powers considerably, he had no choice. The U.S. Marines must pay for their disobedience. Jupiter looked far into the future, far past the timeline where he'd snatched the 13th MEU, looking for fearsome and deadly warriors with absolutely no mercy or morality. Reaching forward in time with the last of his strength, he called forth those warriors. Then the deity known as Jupiter fell to its knees, defeated by the decision of one marine commander. Jupiter sighed, knowing for the first time in its long life the fear of mortality. Then, on the beaches of Regium, two thousand Chinese marines suddenly appeared, giant laser weapons mounted upon the shoulders of their very heavy battle armor, thermal targeting crosshairs imprinted in their irises, scanning for something to kill. And so once again, we reach the end of tonight's podcast. My thanks as always to the authors of those wonderful stories, and to you for taking the time to listen. Now, I'd ask one small favour of you. Wherever you get your podcast from, please write a few nice words and leave a five-star review, as it really helps the podcast. That's it for this week, but I'll be back again same time, same place, and I do so hope you'll join me once more. Until next time, sweet dreams and bye-bye.